cool. So there you go. Um, I want to start with easy questions. Yes, right? let's go. Um, so, what is work? <laughs> That's an easy question. Um, there is um, an, uh, an idea that's been popularized that um, when man wants to achieve something that he cannot do alone, then he will need cooperation from others. Mm -hmm. And to get that cooperation, um, coercion was necessary in some situations. Mm -hmm. So when coercion is not necessary, we call it play. And when coercion is necessary, we call it work. Con conversation between people. Coercion. Ah, coercion. Force. Yeah. Okay. Okay. If I need to force you to do it, yeah. then it's work. If uh, you do it because it's a play, okay. then that would be uh, for your own pleasure and freely on your own sovereignty. Then that would be play. So work is coercion in, a, in some sense. It's inherent. Uh, yeah. Coercion yeah. and. Travail, the word travail comes from tribalium, yeah, it, which is uh, torture. Exactly. Um, okay. Okay. Um, and and can someone do work on their own? Because by this logic, you can only work by being coerced by someone else. Can you be independent and work? Or is this like, I don't know, if you're climbing a tree to, to get some food? Yeah. Is that work being done? Yes, now we are playing on words. There is another definition of work, which was not the first meaning I'm thinking about and most of us are thinking about when we say what is work. Yeah. But you know, if you want to be a very good um, mountain climber or um, ping pong player, you will work on your right hand and you will work your left hand and your spin, etc. Right? You, so you can freely have this activity to improve yourself and indeed we use the word work in a different sense uh, because here I am uh, in a kind of self-coercition I'm mm -hmm. forcing myself but um, given that I am doing it upon myself mm -hmm. you know uh, is it really coercion I'm not sure mm -hmm. I'm not really forced right right so it's a I think there's it's just a the word work has a double meaning mm. and so we just need to clarify which mm. meaning we want to talk about. Clear, clear. And we could argue that um, there is some amount of self-coercion because you're doing it not purely out of free will. It could be by conditioning, it could be yes. coercion by societal pressure or whatever. So you make up, diet, yeah. buying clothes, yeah. shopping. Okay, so, so what one does of free will is play. Let's stick with this uh, with this definition. And what one is coerced to do, including coerced by themselves or by unknown forces, is uh, work. Um, and then maybe you can tell me uh, what you think is the purpose or value of work. And then we can double click uh, on how do we define value. Like, what do you think? is value or has value um, well value is uh, something that um, uh, I will subjectively define right so I see value in things mm -hmm. so it's like beauty you know beauty in the as we say beauty in the eyes of the observer mm -hmm. so value is uh, what will uh, attract my my interest right I will find it valuable because uh, I will have a, a emotional bond. I would feel the need of. Uh, 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 I would feel the need of uh, looking at something or trying to capture it or mm. keep it close to me. Mm. And 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 what's the value of work? Value in work. And then again, is it being created for the person working, or by definition, is it then being created for the person that is worse in you to working? Um, there is a lot of uh, value or purpose in having uh, this uh, forceful coercion activities. Right? Um, you can start from your worldview. Right? Uh, 
your religion. Why are we on this planet? Uh, there's this other guy who suffered 2000 years ago uh, mm -hmm. for me and now I need to suffer as well to pay for my sin or uh, whatever. So I may have been educated in developing a worldview where I think that uh, suffering, being part of life, um, is something important that I need to practice. And as such, work is very important uh, because it's a way for me to uh, end up in heaven, basically, mm -hmm. right? To earn my paradise. There's, there's, a, there's a book called 5,000 Years of Debt. Yes. And it talks about the primordial yeah. debt which you are born with and that you that you are born into life to pay back a debt <laughs> sort of redemption. David Greber exactly so so uh, there is a world view that uh, drives people to uh, think that it is necessary to suffer and therefore it is necessary to work, to work. and that that helps uh, them fulfill themselves so okay i i know why i am i am on this planet and what is my uh, life mission mm -hmm. and there are other people who might or might not see the world this way but who see the opportunity to exploit the first category mm -hmm. by telling them yeah you're right you should mm -hmm. suffer it's a good thing uh, go ahead uh, do the work and i will uh, i will harvest the fruits by the way mm -hmm. because that's not necessarily what you're looking for. Yeah, and there's also probably people in between who are being exploited and who are also exploiting forward, right? Yeah. Um, part of the, the narrative yeah. and the story. <clears throat> uh, but there is some value in um, this finding meaning or my purpose of being here that you said, that people actually do find in work, right? They do find through work, through a profession, through a work, uh, something that that as you were talking about earlier, something that's within them that needs to come out, right? Some some meaning or some purpose. Okay, there is a fraction of people who find the meaning in work, meaning who find the meaning in the fact that someone is telling them what to do. Mm. But we should not neglect the big chunk of people who find the meaning in the achievement of their work, right? Mm. Uh, most of people uh, uh, also uh, working on uh, I don't know building a spaceship uh, yeah. find the meaning in uh, the achievement of uh, sending uh, their car uh, in space <laughs> in outer space uh, not from the fact that uh, they have a boss telling them yeah. how to do it uh, so how do you define the value of sending a car into a spaceship or this <laughs> <laughs> right. there is no intrinsic value there uh, but it then, does not attract my attention. Mm. <laughs> but then, could you then argue that people who do find um, intrinsic value in their work are indeed finding play within their work? They they are trapped, let's say, and they are being coerced into working, and then yet they manage to find some sort of a space within the uh, the work to find play within yes. within the space. Yes, I think there is a, a lot of people who are uh, in within uh, big corporates who know they have to obey some set of rules, uh, and, but who see those rules like uh, the rule of a game yeah. and who think they are playing a game. Yeah. It's both uh, good for them because uh, I would I would see them as on their free will, even though they are. Uh, Mm. within the fixed boundary of their job yeah. and on the other hand it's kind of worrying me for the lack of consciousness they might put in what they achieve in what they do because uh, you know if you play a game of uh, a board game then yeah. at the end of the, the game mm. it's all over and you can start over but when it's real life game and you're burning the, all the oil in this planet yeah. you, know, you can only do it once so yeah. So uh, it's also quite um, a worry for me, a concern that uh, people are enjoying their work <laughs> without placing uh, too much uh, consciousness about uh, the external uh, impact. Uh, but, but then also you, you have more and more people seeking work that resonates with them more, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, I know people who were working in data science before in fintech and they felt that 
um, their skills are not most useful in fintech but rather in let's say health tech or uh, i know someone who moved to um, the shipping industry like actual shipping industry uh, building models to optimize the routes of ships to reduce um, carbon consumption. consumption right and, yep. and to me it's it's somewhere in between um, play and then finding a small playground within the workspace right um, so could you say that actually there is a possibility of carving out a small playground where you're at ease you're at comfort with um, the play and yet you're playing the rules uh, playing by the rules of the game but then within that within those rules you built a sub universe where they're actually playing yes so you so you be building your own ecosystem inside the larger ecosystem yeah. right yeah. and especially if you work well and if you are a scarce resource yeah. you'll be given a and of freedom yeah. for you to design your own uh, your work your own work and find your own mini yeah but i'm still questioning about um, how about the bigger ecosystem yeah. within the whole society yeah. right so if you are if you are happy to uh, uh, help the super tankers to consume less oil while carrying the oil yeah. you are still part of feeding the the oil the oil industry yeah. and helping the society burn more oil mm. right? but you could you could see this as i mean this could be a step towards because if you go from one one job to another you're probably taking one step towards or one step closer towards what makes sense so it could be an intermediate step that that's still going towards so it so the question then remains uh, in order to find in order to find yourself playing rather than working let's say in this in this uh, definition uh, must one quit work or can you actually find play within the work to some extent to, to varying degrees or are you arguing that one must actually just quit the working system and restart or reimagine how they work how they see work or how they see what they can i think we i think we find play uh... Our human nature makes us find play everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, even uh, though uh, as a child we play a lot, and then we're being taught not to play. But uh, even if you get people in in prison, they end up uh, playing with whatever they have to kill time. Right. Yeah. So you can always find play in your environment. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that uh, to find meaning and purpose, you have to look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. But to find play, you can look just at your narrow environment and mm. at your own subsystem okay okay so then uh, meaning and purpose are above work and play so just play like just being uh, in an environment of play mm. uh, is not enough what you're arguing is not enough to find meaning and purpose there is some element of creation if i may add <coughs> yeah the your narr your global narrative right? yeah. having consciousness about the world you're living and how you see it and how you where you want to to drive it and what you want to give to your to the future generation mm. so is there, is can i understand that there is an element of consumption and creation both in what you're saying or can you just for example let's say i spent my rest of the rest of my life learning um exploring the universe understanding the universe uh, but i don't create anything or or do you think that there needs to be some creation um, that accompanies consumption I can't even see it. I'm back in peace with Tony. I um does so why I am convinced that play is uh, you know in our nature and we all feel and want to play I I don't have a fixed opinion about creation <laughs> However, uh, from my own experience uh, in a kind of natural stage as a as a kid all the children they they like to create right they're creating all the time so again uh, I'm not a scientist but I would tend to think that uh, as a human being we, we do feel this urge inside ourselves to to create to create yeah. mm. and and I, if you don't see it would you say that there is something that has uh, that has killed it 
kill this urge. Yeah, I would feel that if I see someone who is never creating at all, mm. I would I would wonder if mm. that person has been uh, domesticated, you know, or has been taught and raised just to 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 kill the inner child in them. And uh, I I don't want to maybe uh, you know give lessons or tell them how they should think. Yeah, but I would try to seek in their in their life in in the narrative they have built for their own life and meaning what what has killed their inner child sure. and uh, and uh, well, I, I I just hope that uh, it's not a big um, uh, it, it doesn't hinder them to be to be happy right sure. because uh, I wish everyone to be happy, you know, uh, maybe, you know, happiness is something you cook inside yourself, in your guts, with the inputs you get from the outside world, and so I'm not gonna decide for others if they're happy or not, but if I, someone, if I imagine someone who's never engaging into the slightest uh, creative act, well, uh, well, I'm not good, well, I'm not good. I would not be comfortable feeling responsible for that situation. Mm. Mm. That is true. That is true. And then again, what to create is probably a very subjective uh, experience. What they want to create for yeah. themselves. Yeah. Would you count creating money as part of the? <laughs> Someone that when you create, it has to be from nothing, right? Mm. So uh, yes, if I if you. <laughs> Taking a white piece of paper and drawing um, <laughs> banknotes, <laughs> you would create money, and that would be creative. Also, <laughs> um, moving a bit uh, further here, um, what's the role of collaboration in this work slash play? Um, so you can create. So let's say, let's say that there is without going too deep into it, there is some value, some intrinsic value in play and in creation. Um, and here we are talking about play and creation in the in as opposed to work in the definition that we defined, right? Um, what's the role of collaboration in play and creation versus say playing alone or creating alone? Think it happened. Why do we need need other people, or do we need other people? I uh, <laughs> I would not think there is a single answer to that. Um, there is there is this um, well known um, distinction between uh, people who are introvert and extrovert. Right, mm -hmm. the introvert finds energy in being alone, and an extrovert would find energy in being surrounded by others. Right? Mm -hmm. So. For the extrovert, collaboration is a way to just fuel themselves. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, if I want to have more energy at the end of the day mm -hmm. than at the, in the morning when I wake up, I need to be surrounded by people. So, if you are an extrovert, you would seek for that in cooperation, mm -hmm. right? But there is uh, other reasons to seek for cooperation and collaboration, mm -hmm. such as uh, um, my uh, self-esteem. Mm -hmm. I would like to see gratitude in the eyes of people who surround me because I need that to, to to feed my ego because for whatever reason, my childhood, my past, or you know, or the way I was raised and the narrative I build about the world, I, my world view, about the world I live in, I, uh, I need that uh, gratitude in the eyes of people surrounding me. So then that would be another way to, to fuel uh, to, to drive me into a cooperative uh, cooperative action. Right. When there be there are probably uh, many others. You know, we're, we're, I believe in God and I want to build a tower to go to heaven and so I can do it alone. Or I just want to uh, uh, procreate, we're, so I need to mate. Uh, I want to fix what my ancestors have done. Yeah. And I cannot do it alone as well, mm. but I feel responsible for it because, after all, I'm a descendant of the colonial times. Mm. You know, so I, I would, uh, 
I would not imagine, or maybe there is a cause for the cause, the root cause of all yeah. these causes, but I, I, I don't, yeah. I don't see. I think there will be many reasons people are willing to collaborate. And, and would you say, uh, <clears throat> even for the, uh, let's say, even for an introvert that prefers, actually finds energy from being alone, mm-hmm. um, I would imagine that the creation would have to interact with the world. Like you still need to absorb information from the world yeah. and then put your information out in the world so that it fights, like your ideas fight with other ideas yeah. in whichever form. Yeah. Um, so maybe that's also, maybe that's, yeah, um, maybe that's not purely collaboration, but then someone watching a, uh, a piece of art that you've created and then making a comment on it is also in some form co-creation or collaboration because you're getting some feedback from the universe to on what you created right yeah right. so uh, maybe even working solo could require actually will require ultimately uh, some exposure out into the world you cannot box yourself out right yeah it's you're, you're uh, creating an artist art is exposing yourself you know it's showing your vulnerability sure. and I fundamentally believe that um, Man is a social animal, and so those those connections we have uh, with each other, with fellow humans, is is a is a essential need of our uh, of our being. You know, there there is a this common uh, representation of the Maslow pyramid, where you see like shelter at the bottom being very large, and then the food, and then. The higher it goes, uh, the needs are, um, are thinner, right? Yeah. But <laughs> what, what turns out is Maslow did not depict the needs of humans as a pyramid. Mm. He just listed them. Mm. And I think we should um, rather see it as a time scale. Mm. If you don't drink for uh, three yeah. days, you die, you die, you die right? Mm. If you don't eat for three months, you die. Mm. But if you if you are isolated for three years, maybe you become crazy and then you will die as well yeah. because you cannot behave properly and you will yeah. fall through the ravine from the mountain or whatever. Yeah. So it's just that the, the, the hierarchy between the needs is yeah. just some I get you killed in the short term, <laughs> the other one will get you killed yeah. in the long term because you will not have a, it's a, offsprings. But right? those urgency of needs, not, not yeah. hierarchy of needs. I, I see it as a, yeah, as a, a time scale difference mm. rather than uh, importance, mm. you know. Uh, I mean, you might argue that dying tomorrow is a more important concern than dying in one year, but you might also argue that if, if in both both cases you end up the same, mm. you know, yeah. there might be of equal importance. Clear. Um, yeah, and also again, if you don't interact with the the world, it's this question of. Uh, if a tree fell in a forest and nobody heard it, did it really fall? That that question arises, right? Like, so if, even if you created something beautiful, but um, the world never saw it, did yeah. you really create it? Like, you know? yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think if you if you uh, make a painting in your garage, and then you burn it, you're not an artist. You become an artist at the second your creation is shown to the outside world and at the second you are exposing yourself to being criticized okay. that's where you become an artist it's not when you paint if you paint someone else you make a copy like they do in china there are entire village who duplicate paintings of mona lisa for sale those people they are maybe craftsmen but they are not artists they're just copying if if it's ugly they would say you know I didn't do it. It's Leonardo. Yeah. <laughs> Complain to Leonardo. I just copied the thing, yeah. right? I'm not responsible. Yeah. I'm not hurt. Yeah. It doesn't make me want to cry or it doesn't make me sad when you say that this painting is is, is uh, ugly because I didn't do it. So you are an artist at the second where being criticized will hurt you. Yeah. And it will hurt you because you put your guts and you're showing it to the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. And in that sense, entrepreneurs are artists as well. Mm. They have something in their mind that doesn't exist. They argue that it should exist. They create it and they, ex- they are being exposed to being criticized by other people saying uh, your project is uh, bad for the world or it's crazy or whatever. Yeah. 
well again we could go into definitions of what you would call an entrepreneur and what you would not call an entrepreneur uh, because there's also uh, over factorization of fact- factorization of uh, of uh, entrepreneurship i guess there's yeah. some tried and tested techniques that you need to follow to there's like a formula of entrepreneurship right which i guess then is craft more than art if you if you just it is a play by the book yeah and then when people try to criticize you say i just did what the book said yeah that you're not an uh, you're not an artist yeah um yeah which is which is also one of the reasons why i, I um so <laughs> Business school didn't sit well with me because it felt like there was a formula, you know. <laughs> for, for, for some, actually, no school sat well with me. I don't know why I, I spent so many years in education. I don't know if I learned something from it. <laughs> um, okay. Um, then, when two people collaborate with each other in a traditional work setting, in an employment setting, versus in a creation or play setting right like, um what's the difference in the contract between these two people um one working in an organization in a company in a job as employer employee or colleagues and another as co-creators collaborators for so the, what's the subtlety or what's the difference in the contract nature of contract between these two people Well, when you are in a in a labor uh, contract situation, mm-hmm. you no, know, the contract you don't look at until the things go wrong, right? And when things go wrong, you take the contract and you look at what it says. And if there is a compliance issue, then you will refer to a superior authority, a third party, right? That will arbitrate. You have a jury that is uh, so so. So that settings is is not a two party setting. Mm-hmm. It's a three party setting. Mm-hmm. There's the employer, there's the employee, and there's the yeah. government, yeah. right? Who is going to set under any dispute? Mm-hmm. In the second situation, where you cooperate and you play, um, in a healthy play, everyone is totally uh, sovereign, right, on their own free will. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I do what I do because I want to do it, and you, therefore I have nothing to. There is not no third party mm. to discriminate or to arbitrate unless unless you and me decide to choose a third party, mm. which can happen. Uh, but it's not a, a written contract. Mm. There is an implicit contract more than a. Yeah, there are shared intention. Mm. And is is that always the case, or can there be some hidden, like how do you make in this setting of play rather than work? Like let's say you're creating something with someone, like we are creating something right now, which is a conversation, right? Um, how important is it to because there is some beauty actually in not having a contract. Uh, there is also probably some risk in not having a contract, right? Mm. Uh, how important is it to make this contract explicit? Um, because I had this discussion with one of my friends recently um, about us actually connecting very well, and we spoke about just co-creating stuff together without any contract. And he asked me um, what the ro- what, what the room for accountability was between us. Huh? Say, so, okay, I'm I'm willing to collaborate freely. Mm-hmm. But can we be accountable and accountable towards each other? Uh-huh. So what's let's say like where does accountability fall in this space of no contract or an implicit contract? Um, well, you might want to have a <coughs> you might you might want to have a, a paper contract. You might want to. Choose a situation where one will become the employer of the other, mm. uh, and still be in a play and a free will situation. Mm. Uh, because as much as we want to be two uh, free uh, electrons uh, mm. playing together, we we are still bath into an environment mm. that requires us. For instance, if we want to uh, put money in common. Mm. Uh, either we open a chest and we put uh, cash or Bitcoin, 
Mm. Or we have to go to a bank, and if you want to go to a bank, they'll tell you, well, you need a legal entity, and sure. we drive you to have a legal entity, and then the government will come and say, yeah. you need to pay tax, and for paying tax, yeah. you'll need an employment contract, etc. So you might, although being into a play and free will situation, you might still end up with a legal contract and right. paperwork and and uh, and long-term commitments uh, that, that sound uh, on... That, that sound uh, in contradiction with this idea of uh, of uh, free will and freedom and self sovereignty, um, unless you see uh, you introduce the the idea of uh, commitment, mm. says being on my my own sovereignty and being on my freedom doesn't mean I cannot commit. Mm. Uh, commit on the long term. Mm. And if I'm committed on the long term, I don't mind signing the, pe- the paperwork. We get on track. But doesn't that turn this into a trepanium again? No. It might. It might end up like this. Like, uh, because after some months, I, I, I'm losing, uh, I'm disenchanted, right? I'm losing my interest and I feel tied because actually I thought I could sign this contract. And eventually, uh, you know, love vanished and I want a divorce and now I realize I'm tied with the paperwork. Yeah. So, yeah, there are, uh, there are couples who end up being tied against their will yeah. and there are couples who, uh, 40 years later, are still very happy and still yeah. feel very uh, free and sovereign on their, on, on their choice. Yeah. How do you avoid this? Uh, so let's say you start with play. Mm-hmm. But then at some point you have to put a contract on paper because you're interacting with the rest of the world, let's say, right? You have to bring the state in. How do you preserve the play in this situation? And how do you ensure that it doesn't become a uh, Um What's the, uh, yeah, what's the formula there, let's say? <laughs> I'm not sure that it's a formula. I think it's a... Uh, there's going to be one a mindfulness exercise, you mm-hmm. know? You meditate. You, as you look at yourself in the mirror every morning and you're being honest with yourself mm-hmm. about uh, am I still in the game? Or uh, did, I, uh, uh, did I let me uh, be dragged into a place I did not want to go? Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a permanent questioning and re-questioning exercise, I believe. So maybe a contract which has no barriers to exit, a contract that allows you to, somehow allows you to walk, walk away any day. Yeah, but then... So uh, the contract is applicable till the day you show up. But then you have a, I don't know, lowest possible fiction to exit. To exit. Yeah. Maybe that's a contract that, that allows you to maintain a bit of display. <clears throat> because on one hand, if you have some sort of a contract, I know that tomorrow you're going to show up, right? Which means I might take you for granted. Yeah. Which means I might ask you to do things that you don't. You know, I know you don't want to do, right? Yeah. Um, or or uh, there might be one day when I show up when I really don't want to show up, right? And the moment that happens, you're sort of deviating, is beginning to deviate from the from the path of creativity or play. Right? But. Honestly, I think uh, when it comes to personal one-to-one relationships, sure. uh, I'm not sure uh, paperwork can be that strong. I mean, can be stronger than your personal relationship. Sure. Uh, you so, t- what's at risk is a personal relationship, basically. Yeah, and what will warrant the the loyalty and the long-term solidarity, and you know, it's always going to be the the strength of our bond, you know, uh, all those uh, couple where he or she, uh, mostly unfortunately, she is beaten up by the husband uh, because he's having a, a psychological domination on her. It's uh, crazy to believe, but uh, it's their psychological domination that drives this woman to you know, stay there while they are being beaten up. So the strength of uh, of psychological domination is mm. underestimated, I think. Mm. But it's still not a free contract then. It's not a free will, free contract per se. Well, that's my point is to say that uh, 
it's not the paper contract that yeah. is the most dangerous right. pitfall right. to the loss of free will and freedom. Right. Right. As if you are in a small group, the what you should be concerned is not uh, what the contract says on the paper. What should be concerned is the the, the relationship of mutual influence and mutual domination uh, yeah. between um, between between the two of you. Mm. And, and sometimes even legal contracts break. Right, like even if you take a loan, you have the right to default. Mm -hmm. You have the right to bankruptcy. I yes. Guess. Uh, so even um, a handshake or a, or an implicit contract or an explicit contract, circumstances change from one day to another that don't don't allow you to actually respect the, the contract. And I guess in this case, the only collateral is the relationship. Yeah. Uh, so you're going all in and saying, look, uh, and I guess that's how trust also works because it's a bit of a leveraged activity that we do. So I leverage the trust between us to take some debt mm -hmm. as, uh, against this trust that we have. And then it grows the trust. We, we grow the trust and then we take larger debt, you know, and, and of course, one day we can default on this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and so now maybe just coming to to uh, last couple of questions uh, because uh, the conversation was more to understand both Opal team, mm -hmm. um, which you have been championing for for several years now, and you run an organization in Teal um, org structure, and and also. Um, an open collective so an account set is working as an open collective um, the question uh, I had was one if you can shed light on the subtlety or the difference between run, running an organization in Opal deal versus having an open collective so what's the what, what are the differences and second uh, what holds these organizations together what's the binding force if it's not um, I, I don't know what you mean by running an organization rather in in, in teal. Well, you you if you've been advocating a teal form of organization, yeah, and you've been championing it within your organization. Yeah. So 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 uh, in that context, I just want to understand the difference between um, um, Opal slash teal mm -hmm. and working in an open free collective like the set. Yeah. And second, in both of these formats, what's the if the if, what's the contract that's bringing us the uh, that's making us show up? Yes, sir. We should build up. Um, there is um so. Teal Opal is, is described as a... Um, uh, the stockpiling of several stage, what you call the stage of consciousness. And you should see it as if um, Teal is a, is a wrapper uh, within you within which if you open it you will see people cooperating uh, inside this wrapper you will you you have the uh, the green layer and then within the green layer you have the orange layer and with the orange layer and so far and so on you have the red layers right so you want teal is uh, a form of agility that doesn't require to have uh, pyramidal hierarchies and uh, labor contract, but that is able to integrate the, them mm. into forms of as an acceptable form of production, mm. right? So, but of course, uh, if if you take an, a, a group of individuals, take four hundred. Individuals, 
Uh, what do they have in common? They share the same purpose. They want to develop Vietnam and social entrepreneurship and sustainability and sharing knowledge. But within these 400, you find out that 300 are bound together by a written paper contract mm. under the same jurisdiction. Mm. And then you will say, okay, within the 400, there is a, that cluster yeah. that is very orange, actually. Mm. Okay. Uh, so maybe their mindset, maybe some of them are on their free will, mm. and even though they signed the contract. Uh, but it is allowed to doubt. And it is allowed to think that out of the 300, maybe only 10% of them are really in that uh, self-sovereignty and free will mindset yeah. in their wholeness. And 90% of them are still uh, working uh, like a clockwork. Yeah. Whereas the other 100 who do not have a contract, you cannot object you cannot say oh they are not here on their free will because they have not signed the contract mm. right so it guarantees uh, um, it guarantees uh, a more uh, uh, it guarantees more the, the the free will and the freedom of the individuals to right uh, which uh, is a good uh, a good way to uh, to try to build a very teal environment with a lower chunk of orange inside <laughs> or a lower chunk of green inside right right but it's interesting that to notice that even uh, even though there are no contract within these 100 people when there is one project that arises mm. let's make a festival or let's organize this or that then until someone takes uh, leadership on it, nothing happens. And when that person takes a leadership, yeah. then there is a kind of pyramidal form shape that appears yeah. between the, the, the various participants. Uh, they segment the, the work, right? And they break down the, the structure of the work and people get affected to areas and they will put for their own areas, people as well. So, even though there are no paper contract, you, we can still have a section of time and space where they are organized in a pretty orange way, actually. Yeah. But as soon as the project is done, it dismantles. And the new formation could be very different from the yes. previous formation. So, the, the 100 who do not have a contract will have a uh, more chill and more organic. Uh, we talk about biomimicry, you know, mm. mimicking life in the way they cooperate with each other. On the other hand, they don't cooperate with each other eight hours a day, <laughs> six days a week, uh, because they have their own business as well, right? right? And they are, they, they are not 100% uh, uh, committed and uh, living on on the 47 uh, so yeah people uh, instead you don't have in France we have only 100 people and they are part-time but they have the ability to be purely free and therefore they can protect their sovereignty and their free will whereas in Vietnam uh, we have 300 people part of the same tribe, sharing the same purpose. But them, them they have contracts, uh, they show up every day to, to get a salary. And so the, the fraction of their time that they're spending on free will, uh, compared to the fraction of their time they are spending, uh, because they committed on the long term, uh, uh, they're spending in a more pyramidal structure uh, uh. organization. It's not negligible. Sure. Sure. And is that the goal to reach deal in for, for mankind? The no, for the subsystems, like in in your organization, let's say. Not 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 anywhere in the short time. I mean, we have to adapt with. Or it, it depends on how you. Like, is there a your question? Is okay. 
you have a that we it's integrative right it's like a body and we have organs right so as a as a whole body being teal still uh, leaves room for specific organs to be green or to be orange understood right but but, but these 300 people as you said their 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 contract is different from the other 100 who are more on free will and how yeah. they spend their time in yeah. which form of organization etc so the question is 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 that would that be a goal for those 300 to eventually also grow towards being freer towards being more independent um i used to have that goal but then I realized it was, if they don't want to go there, yeah. I'd be coercive yeah. and forcing them to go where they don't want to go. Yeah. So, what I uh, care about now is that I don't uh, block people who want to move towards yeah. green or field. So there is a path. That, yeah, that the path exists and I cannot be blamed for uh, keeping people in fear or working like machines and without any purpose. Yeah. That's my concern. But I, I appreciate our world, the world we living is 80% orange. And and I understand that we all have a need to, to comply and to look normal and to fit in, uh, you know, because uh, we want to to get married and so to some standard that we yeah. need to show up nice and you know uh, it's a it's a great dilemma for uh, in in the, the the book in Lenin you know the book on Sharon Sandberg she explains that um, uh, you can be a very successful businesswoman mm-hmm. but that reduce your attractiveness mm-hmm. so okay. as a woman you have to choose <laughs> right okay it's very sad, uh, but it's just you know what the numbers show. So uh, I, I I don't want to force people into being very teal if they want to stay orange, uh, but I don't want to be blamed uh, for forcing people to stay into orange or, or red, yeah. uh, right? Being managed by fear, uh, but I do realize that uh, you know thirty percent every time ninety percent of the new hires. Uh, have been growing and raised into a very uh, hierarchical and pyramidal and vertical environment. Right. And that's what they consider being a serious business or good behavior. And I, I, it's like I don't share that view, but I don't blame them for having this view. I'm not their father yeah. to tell them what's good and what's bad. As they will grow up and they will um, grow older, like I did, they will read more books and maybe they will they will join my opinion, but maybe not. Maybe they will grow differently. I don't know. Uh, and, and do you see your posture as being neutral, uh, or do you see your posture as being a facilitator or a catalyst towards team? I I. I I make explicit efforts to mm. convert and convince okay. people. Okay, so more an evangelist. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I. But there are ethics in the evangelist job, right? And I don't want to force people, right? Uh, I want to do it uh, ethically, and that people choose my church on their own will, <laughs> not because I uh, brainwash them or not because uh, I'm hooking them with money or with project, or, you know, or any dishonest way of uh, recruiting for my church. Yeah, it is more important, you know, to have uh, uh, people who truly uh, believe, even if there is a, a lower number of them. Yeah than having a lot of people who just bluntly lie to make me happy because I'm buying their votes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And maybe if you can just very briefly touch upon uh, open collective format. Okay. That's the way so the other a bit more. Uh, open collective the platform? Yeah, the, no, the, an open collective, the format of an open collective where every day you show up is 100% voluntary. Uh, what's the, so 
in particular speaking of the concept yes what's the purpose that people show up um well everyone is showing up for their own purpose right and but by by shedding light on every individual's purpose some people feel they fit better in and some people don't feel they belong too much and eventually it creates it creates some coherence with a with a, a core set of causes that are more or less being shared by everyone uh, so if you as an individual decide if you fit in into the collective by relatively looking at the other people people in the collective right so it's instead of defining uh, a, a company in french we say a what i work in a box that's how we say in french uh, which is defined by its borders right there used to be a law that said there have to be a uh compartments between so many square meters per individual no like if you sit in a in an office yeah. there needs to be a wall between you and the next person there, there's some law that existed until very recently and that said that you need to separate i should not even look at what the other person is doing something i'll come back to this <laughs> i learned very recently about this yeah i'm i'm not surprised <laughs> <laughs> so So, uh, at most organization, be their company or NGO, non-profit, right? That is, they are seen as a box, meaning you define strong borders and you are either in or out, right? You sign your labor contract, you win. You don't sign, you out. We see these borders are fading more and more. Like uh, in the big companies now, uh, you see a mix of external consultant kind of mix up with the employees, although. They are not allowed to have the same email address, so that everybody knows they are from outside, etc. So, so we the border gets uh, blurred, but we still draw a lot of attention about defining those borders. Uh, an open collective is not defined by its border; it's defined by its center. You have the the purpose, the the cause, the why. That's like a big, a giant open fire, yeah. right? And people can come to warm themselves close to the fire or not so close to the fire. You choose your own distance yeah. from the center. And but there is no wall that there is no line drawn that say, okay, once you pass this line, you're in. No, it's just that the closer you are, the more heat you get, and the further you are from the fire, the less heat you get, and that's it. Uh, there are people who are so close that they can. Touch the 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 treasure chest uh, with where there is the 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 money dedicated to serving the purpose. Uh, but again, the open collective, the the, the way it defined is by its center, not by its borders. Uh, clear. So I'll ask you two last questions, and these would be uh, with no follow-up questions in the interest of time. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask you a question and then it's a free. Uh, you can freely take your time to to answer. One speaking of the center, right? Because the idea of a true open collective where people are truly coming freely out of their own will, right, to show up, has to imply that at some point several such collectives with different centers <laughs> should freely merge into one another, right? They should flow into one another, right? Yeah. Which makes me believe that uh, it's a uh, you know like the universe is it's an isotropic universe. So at any point, mm -hmm. um, any point in the universe, right. you look in all directions, it it looks this the universe looks the same, right? Which means that there is no center of the universe. At each point, you could define a new center of the universe. Right? That's how I would imagine a collective of collectives. Which smoothly flows from one into another. I might actually participate 50% of my time in one, 20 in another, 10 different degrees of. And at the end of the day, I guess, in this sense, the only center that you are truly at is yourself. Mm -hmm. Right. So you are sitting on your own treasure chest, mm -hmm. uh, and then there is uh, some other collective center of a few people. So there are multiple centers, right? So, just your thoughts on this uh, to start with, when. How does how does 
cross pollination of such collectives look like one in theory or in, in philosophy and two in practicality because there is for the concept there is a space physical space maybe to show up which means that by being here i'm not being somewhere else and also in parallel in a digital space what does a true free flowing forum look like where you could actually navigate from one dimension to another and be part of multiple centers yeah your thoughts on i got it what was that you're in the you were there you were there he said oh it is it's me up here sure yeah i i think you you describe it uh, pretty well when you say okay what is scarce is time cannot give time i have 24 hours in a day and uh, i can use my time to do things for you but i cannot give you my time like i have 23 hours and now you have 25 yeah so my uh, decision for a day is to decide how much i will allocate mm. being a member of this collective or being a member of another collective mm. right uh, the more i i am drawn to uh, towards the collective I will be closer to the center, to the open fire, and I'll be closer to the chest, and and I will therefore, uh, you know, spend more time and build more projects with this collective than my compared to my secondary collective, to whom I still belong, etc. And then third one, etc. Um, I did not try to run into statistics about how much I, I one person can spend in which collectives. And there is also a, a very subjective aspect to to the to the collective because there is a, one should not see one collective like a, one company, right? Uh, if two legal entities pursue the same purpose, they are not competitors. Yeah, they share the same purpose, right? Yeah. So their chest is at the bottom of uh, uh, next to the same fire. Yeah. Um, and and so then it, it boils down to uh, my uh, in my my subjective my present moment. How do I uh, there is a, how, how do I see and how much in details I want to go. No, there is a there is a like a Russian doll phenomenon on the purple, right? There is the higher purpose of uh, I don't know. Uh, all men should be equal, and then uh, there is a, a purpose within that which is uh, about uh, men and women, and then with men and women there is a sub a purpose about uh, black women in in France, and then there is a sub etc. So I might join the tribe that's overall on equal rights yes. for some time and but after three or five years i find this is not uh, accurate enough and radical enough and because my own true calling is not about equality in general but specifically about women uh, gender equality and, yeah. and and fairness to women and then i will may find a yes. sub collective or another collective so They're not located in space. I don't know if it's a collective within a collective or if it's a, a different fire somewhere else, you know. But um, with with time, I, I definitely uh, mature my worldview, uh, my narrative, and decide to uh, to move from one chest to another chest uh, based on my own priority. And uh, when you when you become a parent, I think you care more about the future generation mm. than before being the same person with the same core values. Mm. And would you say that even though uh, you initiated the concept, I'm correct in assuming that you you initiated the concept, right? Uh, I was in a collective actually. Sorry? We, we were in a collective called Les Eco Workers. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And even even if you are the initiator of the concept, would you, would you then actually admit that your center is not not the center of the concept there is there is a part of your center at the center of the concept there's parts of you which are also around other centers which are yeah. outside of the yeah uh, being a good father is very important to me and it's yeah. not on displayed on the purpose of the concept uh, uh, developing vietnam is also very important to me it's part of the cause i 
I shared, but it got diluted in the whole group. And now, if you look at the, our graphic representation, our board, it doesn't show up anymore. Mm. So, so uh, and so I, I have continue, my own, but they would be in, in another center, or they would have another hmm? sub. Okay. And and so I'm, I I'm not. Uh, Guarding a fire or mm. of any kind, you know. Yeah. No, just wanted to understand. Like, can you be at home even in collective that you started? I, I guess not, because at the end of the day, the only place where you're going to be at home is like in you. Yeah. And not in. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. And last question. Something that we discussed during our first conversation, um, um, which is Slack. So, in order to achieve. Um, this liberty, free uh, format, etc. You spoke about evangelizing. So yes, um, maybe there's some amount of mental conditioning or way of thinking, perspective that needs to change for you to be open to being, let's say, free. But there is also some amount of slack because you might have constraints that enforce you into being uh, in a certain format of work or whatever, right? And what is your opinion on Slack? So we discussed this briefly uh, a few months ago. But how do you arrive at this ideal asymptotic situation where every day you're, you're creating out of free will, your free will, but when you don't have Slack, in the absence of Slack, how do you generate this Slack? Or can you actually arrive at this in the absence of Slack? Um, probably wrong, but I think the slack always exists, but we don't always see it. A lot of people complain they have no slack, whereas actually uh, they do. Uh, or they don't because deliberately their manager is trying to kick them out, right? Mm. And then they should act on that and just leave. Mm. But if you're in a, in a healthy uh, work condition mm. where your manager believes in you, uh, you do have some slack. Mm. But uh, we have been conditioned to believe we don't. Right. There's uh, so many times I, you know, I talk to people in being uh, employees and uh, just give a random idea about something they could do and they just open their eyes like crazy and say, oh, you think I can do that? You think I can say that? I say, but why not? Why is it forbidden? <laughs> Are you right? It's not forbidden. I just never thought about it. Mm. You know, there's so many things we, we never thought about. Mm. In an organization, yes, but in general, I mean, I agree with, to, to, with the statement to the extent that so many people have slack, but they don't see it. But I guess not all people, right? So there's some amount of privilege or access to resources or whatever that might, or life life constraints uh, that you inherit yeah. might mean that you don't have slack. But um, then in, in the context of an organization, I'm guessing what you're trying to say is within most organizations, there is some sort of slack. If there is not, that means your boss is trying to fire you and you should act on it and leave because uh, or someone is... Or it's an exploitative is... organization and... And, and then you should leave. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Most, most IT companies in India they tend to appear uh, um, very friendly uh, working workplaces, but at the end of the day, they're still exploiting. Mm. <laughs> uh, somehow. But not leaving a lot of... If you don't, uh, if, if the game is meant for you to lose, don't play that game. Play mm. another game. Yeah. But then again, Slack uh, yeah. comes in the form that maybe you don't have enough opportunities, maybe you don't have good quality education to, to choose your opportunities. Um, so, as an evangelist of, uh, of, of, of the cult, as an evangelist, would, there, would that be a part of your let's say curriculum or onboarding process where you help people identify either identify slack that exists but they, they are not aware of or build slack with the resources that they have around them um, or give them slack for those who absolutely don't have slack provide them with some slack on them. Um, what I attach myself is to create the psychological safety 
you know, uh, when people think they don't have slack, mostly they censor themselves. Uh, so what, what what I care about is to create that a culture of open debate or self. Um, uh, I was about to say integrity, but uh, until we say wholeness, you know, letting people be themselves and speak freely and openly, and you know, that 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 is what is going to give them some slack, right? Because they will be able to imagine different world. You know, what if? Yes. Scenario, say, okay, how about this, how about that? Yep. And it is by expressing uh, those alternative scenarios, which are dreams, so they're communicating their dreams, right? Uh, and there is a, a, a common perception, a common uh, wisdom that says uh, if dreams cannot be realized, they are useless, they are pointless, and don't share them. I uh, strongly disagree. <laughs> I think that uh, you should express your dreams, even if uh, you don't see how they can be achieved. Uh, most likely, they will never be achieved, but maybe someone can help you. Uh, maybe someone will not get you achieving your dream, but will tell you how to do something else that will fulfill your need at, at the same extent, right? And make you even happier, maybe. So, I believe it starts with uh, open debate, and open debate starts with uh, psychological safety, mm. the ability to uh, show up uh, in vulnerability, the, the ability to show up uh, true to yourself and uh, take the risk of being criticized because people are not going to kill you by criticizing you. They'll just say what they think themselves uh, because free speech is for everyone. Mm. But just so as a thought experiment, if I push this to, to the extreme, I say there's someone in Vietnam who didn't have the opportunity to go to a good school and not educate themselves and hence can't present themselves to you, uh, but then listens to your uh, evangelical speech, gets inspired, comes to you and says, where do I start? Mm -hmm. Well, How? Because today I don't have the skills to get a job, I don't have uh, enough slack to then be free to, to have wholeness, let's say. What's the starting point? But the starting point is to uh, have a come to the events and to uh, discuss and join the Facebook group and uh, and see if we can uh, launch a, a, a pro bono uh, project on your free time or you know just connect with the other people and maybe. Uh, Afterwards, uh, people in the in, inside the company will say, "Okay, uh, we know that you're part of the family. It makes sense for us to pay your training, mm. right?" And we are so show up with whatever you have. Yeah, uh, let's create bond together. Yeah. And bond. then, and then, at some point, people will actually help you upscale. Will help you whatever to, to generate slack for for who you are. Yeah. Okay. Very clear. Um, interesting. So we went just about one hour. Um, we can we can pause here. I, I think I exhausted all the questions I had. Okay, more sure. than the questions I had. <laughs> Excellent. So if you have any parting notes to add to this, well, thank you very much. I hope the the the, the sound quality will be uh, on par. Yeah. Otherwise, we'll have to shoot to record this once again. Yeah, <laughs> so as long as at least one person heard it. <laughs> it's one thing was created, right? Literally, exactly. I heard you and you heard me, so something was created. I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.